Hello, I'm Mally Shansfeld, Managing Editor of Implant Practice US, a Medmark publication. Welcome to a live presentation and question and answer with Dr. Eric Chen. In our webinar today, we will be exploring the foundation of a successful implant practice. We will focus on how to select a treatment modality with the array of available materials and techniques, as well as review the appropriate healing time and closure technique. In this webinar, we will discuss the tried and true methods of ridge grafting and help dispel the myths and misinformation regarding successful and predictable ridge preservation. For this webinar, the CE learning objectives are understanding extraction defect analysis, reviewing available regenerative materials and how to choose between them, recognizing phases of healing and their implications, and discerning principles of surgical closure to maximize bone growth. Before we get started, I would like to invite viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions, and your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Also associated with this presentation is a free CE quiz. At the end of the webinar, we will email all attendees instructions on how to access the CE quiz. I'm pleased to introduce our guest for today, Dr. Eric Chen, who is a graduate of the Loma Linda University's three-year advanced education in implant dentistry. His time at Loma Linda University under Dr. Joseph Kahn and Dr. Jamie Lozada has reinforced his interest in his management of implants and the aesthetic zone. His passion is to share and demystify implant knowledge to help his fellow colleagues achieve predictable results. Dr. Chen and his wife share a private practice in sunny Scottsdale, Arizona with a special focus on cosmetic and implant dentistry. Dr. Chen, we turn the webinar over to you to learn more about our topic for today. Thank you. Howdy, everyone. I hope everybody can uh, hear me well. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the principles of predictable ridge preservation, which is a mainstay in uh, almost every practice now, and especially during this crisis. You know, a lot of extractions are being done. Hopefully, the grafting procedures are being done as well. So let's demystify a couple things, and let's show you what the tried and true methods are. So we will go through the extraction defect analysis, which just is a fancy word for how bad is this extraction socket and how can we reconstruct it for in preparation of implant placement. Also, we'll talk about the regenerative materials that uh, are available and how to choose between them, the phases of healing and their implications, as well as surgical closure, because that is actually a very important part. You know the saying, what ends well, uh, you know, what ends well is, uh, heals well. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that everything that we open up actually becomes uh, closed well as well. And so bone growth is really uh, the goal here. And when we can actually cause healing to occur through good closure, uh, we can actually get a good result. And so this is a video of what you see a normal extraction would be of a number uh, 14 site. And what you have is typically we do a sulcular incision and you guys are already very well versed in this. Uh, and what we want is to have a good, a clean extraction. What you'll see is that a good, clean extraction is the basis of the ridge preservation. And so the first part is doing a good amount of sectioning is really important. And what we found is that most teeth can actually come out from an internal fulcrum. And what that means is that after sectioning, you can see that the 77R elevator is being used to create some leverage and typically the buccal roots can be removed uh, very uneventfully after sectioning is done and fulcruming against the palatal root. And so uh, you can use a mixture of uh, luxators as well as root tip picks and go ahead and remove the roots individually. So this is just to whet the appetite. This is just to set the stage because today we're gonna talk about ridge preservation. And so what we wanna do is to create the minimally traumatic extraction as possible. And here you can see that most palatal roots are actually conical. And so once the two buccal roots come out, we're using a luxator to go ahead and remove the palatal root. Now, a really important part is the debridement of the socket. And here you can see that uh, this sped up video shows the amount of granulation tissue and apical tissue that can be present in all the sockets. And what's really important is that the debridement is done because what causes a bone graft to be successful or not successful is largely due to how well you debride the socket and less about what material that you place. So surgical technique and the basic surgical technique is really important. Here you can see that we've also tunneled into the facial area here to make sure that when we do drape our membrane, we can drape it completely and thoroughly. 
And like I said, these two videos are just to whet the appetite. We're going to go through how all the components and parameters of ridge preservation uh, are being initiated. And, and hopefully you can start to make uh, your own decisions on how to have a procedure that is a predictable procedure for you. Uh, but in our practice, what we do is after extraction and very thorough debridement, we always uh, place a membrane to prevent some soft tissue ingrowth, especially when you have a, a small facial defect like we see here. Uh, you tunnel the membrane in the areas where you want to block out any possible soft tissue ingrowth. Here you can see the delivery of the bone graft material and uh, the mainstay you know, of our practice is FDBA, which is freeze-dried bone allograft, which is min mineralized uh, allograft. And condensation is important. You can never over condense uh, because the blood can actually always seep through. Uh, and what you want is a really nice dense increment. And here you can see the condensation is very intentional. We want to compress the graft particles in a way that causes really good, uh, a good increment, a good mass. And so that when we actually drape over uh, our membrane, we get a really uh, nice bone graft. Now, there are some questions about um, whether a membrane is needed or not, um, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, uh, we would have given you sufficient information and uh, convince you to always use a membrane when you can. So uh, here's one key question that will show up in one of uh, your CE questions, and it is, what is the primary reason for graft failure, especially in a health, healthy patient? Um, like the first video showed, debridement is typically the problem. Uh, if you think about it, even if you extract a tooth and you have never actually done any bone grafting, typically after a couple of months when the patient comes back, you do get bone back. Uh, so the question is, well, if that's the case, then why do we graft at all? And why do grafts even fail if that's the reason? And so what we found is that most providers, they're unsuccessful in grafting only because that their debridement process is poor. Their extraction is done well, but then all that granulation tissue that is very reactive inflammatory tissue infiltrate their bone graft and cause graft failure. And my suspicion is many early implant failures are also due to the fact that the implant is placed in bone that's not fully well integrated and that's what's causing some of the early failures. So, uh, is ridge preservation actually even needed? And there's actually a huge body of uh, evidence and systematic reviews that say that, yes, if you want to preserve a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension of your bone graft in preparation for implant placement, it is indeed important. So what exactly happens? Well, you know, once you actually extract teeth, we know that that buccal increment typically will start to resorb. And this resorption happens uh, very quickly. And most of the time that's because the buccal bone is thinner. And so the, once the vasculature uh, decreases after the surgical insult, you get um, this resorption. And this resorption is actually not uh, as scary as people think. And, and what I mean by that is many people will say, well, if I don't do bone grafting, I can't place an implant. And that's actually not true, right? I mean, most implants right now in the premolar site are placed in the three millimeter, four millimeter range, and some molars are placed in the five millimeter range. And what you'll actually start to find is that, well, you know, if you were to flap it, can you fit an implant? The answer is yes, you can usually fit the implant. But the question really becomes, can you restore it with good contours and still have the ridge uh, have a, a wide enough appearance and a, clean, a cleansable appearance uh, so that you get a good long-term result? And that's really the question because we can typically place implants even in a slightly resorbed ridge. So when we do bone grafting, we're not just thinking about the surgical component. We're also bone grafting so that we can place a normally sized tooth in that site. And so uh, the misconception about how we can't place an implant if the bone doesn't have ridge preservation is actually, uh, it's false, right? Because the average implant size in the posterior is four to five millimeters. So even in a non-grafted ridge, how often do you not have four to five millimeters to squeeze an implant in, right? Um, now, obviously, uh, common sense will tell us that, hey, we want bones surrounding the implant circumferentially. So obviously, we don't just want the bare minimum of bone. 
Um, but what about a vertical dimension, right? The shortest implant is four to six millimeters. So, you know, we actually don't nowadays really need that much height either. So a lot of people say, well, then why do we graft that off? Well, uh, again, this is a restorative and a surgical consideration. So grafting is both. The thinnest two-piece implant now is 1.8 millimeters, which is nothing. So as we can see, implants can still be placed in compromised ridges, but uh, what we don't want is ridge shrinkage because that causes the implant placement to be high risk. Uh, also, it's difficult to use a large platform implant with adequate uh, bony envelope. And that's really important when we're trying to cause the emergence profile to be good, right? When we're trying to restore a molar, for example, and you place a five millimeter implant, in what space are you going to cause this five millimeter diameter to explode out into this 12, maybe even 13 millimeter molar? Uh, that's the emergence profile. And we wanna make sure that we have a large enough implant uh, or a deeply placed enough implant to cause the emergence profiles to still be uh, an adequate profile for cleansability as well as aesthetics. So many times we know exactly where the implant is in somebody's mouth because it almost looks like Noah's Ark. It almost looks like uh, a restoration that's just beached uh, and, and we don't want that. And typically it doesn't look like the rest restoration is coming out of the soft tissue. It almost appears that the restoration is just sitting on top and floating on top of the gums. So if you're uh, encountering that, a lot of times that's because the ridge width itself is insufficient for the restoration uh, that is present and necessary. So the technical healing process uh, starts with a surgical injury and that surgical injury will cause, uh, you know, and that could be caused by the sulcular incisions, that could be caused by crestal incisions, that vertical incision. So all the uh, incisions, also the actual trauma from the, the extraction itself, the pressure that is um, delivered not only to the teeth, but to the bone, to the soft tissue. Uh, and what we have right after surgical injury is that we have uh, blood that basically pulls up. And once the blood pulls up, uh, it's really important that we keep the blood clot in place. And, and the reason being the blood clot is what becomes bone, right? So even if we did no grafting at all, once this hemostasis occurs, you want that hemostasis uh, to, to create a blood clot that is stable. And you want to do everything you possibly can to, to, to prevent that blood clot from not maturing, right? And that's why we get things like alveolar osteitis. Uh, and also, if you don't have a mature blood clot that's going to sit there, then you don't have good uh, vital burn, uh, bone turnover. Now, with that being said, when we put a bone graft in, what are we actually doing to the blood clot itself? And we will talk about that. So, you know, one of the more, most important things about having blood there is that this causes the initial neutrophil infiltration to do some cleanup activity. Uh, also, some inflammatory markers start to come in to cause uh, the inflammatory reaction. And the inflammation reaction is really important uh, for the, the, the healing process. So this inflammatory process will occur whether you place the bone graft or not, right? And so what the bone graft really does, uh, a densely packed bone graft, is that it's going to influence the blood clot uh, to become bone. And, and the reason being the blood clot is going to have osteoinductive and osteoconductive influences from the bone particles. Uh, and, and even without bone uh, grafting, this does occur. However, once you have the bone graft actually in place, uh, what it does is that it prevents the soft, soft tissue uh, from being the main influencer of the, the blood clot. And, and as the inflammatory reaction is continuing, you get um, some phagocytosis uh, of the necrotic debris. And, uh, and what you want is that you want this granulation of soft tissue to cover up your, your bone graft. And that could happen either naturally, uh, but typically we don't want the bone graft particles to migrate. And so what we have is uh, usually, usually a use of some sort of collagen membrane to cause proliferation. So uh, one of the things that you know some patients, when they look inside, they, they get a little freaked out by is that they'll see uh, some white areas. And what you need to tell the patient is that, hey, this is the fibrin layer. And this fibrin layer is really important for granulation to occur. And that granulation layer uh, is what allows the epithelium to start to bridge over the, the socket site. So all these things have to actually happen for the ridge preservation procedure to go well and for remodeling to actually occur. And once you have good soft tissue coverage, usually that takes about eight weeks, uh, that is when you start to have maturation um, of the trabecular bone. And, 
and that's just the start of it. And the soft tissue will continue to contract. And so uh, there are some soft tissue procedures that you may or may not need to do uh, once you start the implant placement process. So we just went through the technical process of actually uh, going through extractions and healing. Uh, but the truth is that that technical process isn't what we really think about. And so really it's the influence model uh, that we really think about. So what I mean by that is make it simple for yourself. You know, I'm not a very smart person, and so I try to make it very basic. So when a tooth comes out, a blood clot sits inside the socket, right? And the blood clot has every potential to become every soft, uh, soft or hard tissue in your body. The question is, why is it that when you have a laceration, let's say, on your arm on the skin. Why does that blood clot eventually become skin and, and connective tissue? It's because it's influenced by the surrounding and the environment is really what causes a blood clot to be one thing or the other. So it's not even what bone graft we place per se, it's the environment that we create. So for example, if you're a dentist, uh, and uh, your wife's a dentist and your brother uh, is a dentist and now your child is asking, hey, what should I do when I grow up? Uh, in a kind of an impressionable teenager uh, may look around and say, hey, everybody's a dentist, therefore I'm also going to be a dentist. Um, and obviously this model is very basic. However, uh, that's kind of how the blood clots work. There are osteonectins and chemofactors and chemokines um, from both the environment uh, of the blood clot and the particles that are packed in. And so when the blood clot looks around, it looks to the left, it sees bone. It looks to the right, it sees bone, forward, backward bone, bottom bone. The only time where a clean extraction where the blood clot does not see the actual uh, bone is, is just on the top, right? It's where the tooth came out from. And so that's the, the purpose of the membrane. The membrane is to block out that sort of negative influence that soft tissue can have. And the reason is the soft tissue will typically mature and migrate faster than bone will. And we know this uh, because epithelium moves very quickly, right? You know, if you've, if you've placed implants, once you've placed an implant on a Friday, let's say, somehow on, you know, Saturday, you get a call and the patient is freaked out saying that, oh my gosh, my implant fell out. Uh, the truth is the implant did not fall out, right? It's usually the healing abutment. So on Monday, you bring the patient in, you really hope it's not the implant. And sure enough, when you look inside the mouth, you almost see nothing because that five millimeter diameter has been completely closed over by soft tissue uh, because soft tissue moves much faster than bone. And so even though it is true that it is possible to still have bone once you extract a tooth and don't do any ridge preservation, um, it's not a very predictable way. And you also get more retraction than if you did it, right? And so uh, we are doing ridge preservation, not just for the sake of the idea of packing bone somewhere. The, the whole point is to try to influence the blood clot because at the end of the day, it is still the blood clot that becomes the vital bone. And that's the vital bone turnover that we need. And so uh, the joke, you know, kind of is, you know, only graph the sites you want predictable success, right? Because, uh, you know, as a private practice person, you know, I, I just can't afford to do any redos. And so uh, this, uh, this ridge preservation really is to maximize the re-entry procedure so that every re-entry is your only re-entry for implant placement and you don't actually have to, you know, redo something because that's chair time, that's cost of the practice, you got to pay your staff as well as you just created distrust between you and your patient. So what choices uh, do we have? And we're gonna go back to the basics, right? So uh, there are a couple bone substitutes that we can do and one of them is the xenograft and the xenograft is you know, in this picture at least is bovine, but xenograft just means it could be anything that is non-human uh, and non-synthetic. And so every other species, even coral, there's actually a xenograft made of coral. Uh, and then there's also allograft and there's mineralized and demineralized for allograft and allograft is of human, right? And so typically is donated cadaver tissue. And then there's alloplast, uh, which is synthetic. And so how do you choose in between them? Uh, and so one of the key questions in the CE questionnaire is uh, what particle size are appropriate? And we're just going to give it out right now. So typically you have uh, different types, but you also have different sizes. And the different sizes include, uh, you know, it goes all the way from 100, I've seen 100 all the way to 2,000 microns. And typically 250 to 1,000 microns is where you want to be uh, for most grafting procedures, okay? And so... Uh, how do we choose in between? Well, typically the choice is between your uh, need for volume maintenance versus your need for uh, time, you know? So 
DFDBA is the demineralized allograft, right? It's demineralized cadaver human bone. And typically that only takes three months for 80% uh, of that turnover to happen. Uh, if you were to need more volume maintenance in, in the sense that you want more uh, volume when you get back, you need more of that scaffolding effect. You want to prevent uh, as much resorption as you possibly can. Then the alloplast and the FDBA, uh, which is the mineralized uh, human bone as well as the synthetic bone, uh, is kind of in between and it usually is ready in about four to six months. And the xenograft, you know, uh, some studies have shown that it takes almost years before the xenograft particles are completely turned over into vital bone. But typically I would say six to eight months wait uh, is adequate. So uh, what you're gaining in one end in terms of volume maintenance, you also have to take the brunt of that end, which is uh, you, you have slower turnover turnover of bone. So when you're trying to do a large grafting procedure to create a lot of volume, typically you have to wait longer, but you can sort of uh, err on the side of xenographic type materials. Uh, on the other hand, if you have very clean extractions and all the bony walls are present and, and you're kind of in a hurry and the patient's in a hurry, you can move more towards the DFDBA. In my practice, I kind of sit in the middle. And so uh, what I do is I almost exclusively, exclusively only use FDBA, which is the mineralized allograft. So what is the main difference between DFDBA and FDBA? Uh, and that is a key question in the questionnaire as well. Uh, the main difference is just the uh, demineralization, right? And so the demineralization, what it does mean is that you can typically go faster. Uh, and, and the reason being, uh, it takes less time for your body to break it down and turn over to vital bone. However, being demineralized and being that it gets resorbed faster, it also has less of uh, the ability to create that scaffolding effect. So you typically, for DFDBA, you wait less time. For FDBA, you wait more time. And like I said, in my practice, I usually use FDBA uh, and, and we typically would do uh, four months is a, is a very normal number for almost all our cases. And uh, part of ridge preservation, not only is the bone grafting part important, we also talked about how fast soft tissue moves. And part of that it was the, remember the soft tissue granulating over, uh, how do we promote that fibrin layer? How do we promote the epithelial coverage? Well, part of it is that we don't want it to grow into the bone graft because that takes months to heal, whereas soft tissue only takes weeks to heal. So there's a couple methods for you to cover the site to promote the soft tissue from bridging into the actual bone graft but to bridge above it. Uh, and that's the use of ex a, a, an exclusive membrane, something that will exclude soft tissue cells, but still uh, allow angiogenesis to occur. So there's the cork method, which is just basically corking something uh, using uh, you know, a smaller membrane, the circular membrane, just to cap the socket. Uh, you can use a mask method, which I think is good for 90% of the cases, uh, and it's it's basically draping a membrane into the buccal and lingual um, flaps so that you actually get a really nice condensation and protection of that bone graft, and it really makes sure that the soft tissue has no chance of getting into the bone graft. Uh, and the last is seal, which is using both a membrane as well as primary intention closure uh, for cases that are a little bit more tricky uh, and have uh, more defects. So uh, these are the three different uh, offerings from Implant Direct, but really uh, the difference between the cork method is the cork method uses membranes that are non-cross-linked. So they usually go away in about you know four days to you know, two, three weeks. And typically that's your colla plug or your collagen plugs and your colla tape or collagen membranes and that are non-cross-linked. And this again, you are, the cork method is great when you have a clean extraction and you haven't really laid a big flap of any sort and you can just cork that uh, socket site. The mask method, uh, I use almost 90% of the time because I like to lay uh, small flaps at least to, to get the teeth out because it's more predictable. Uh, and then you go ahead and you tuck it in. And the cool thing about the mask method is you can use both a resorbable and a non-resorbable uh, membrane for it, except the non-resorbable membrane, you do have to remove, some people remove it in three weeks, some wait to six weeks, it really depends. Uh, and then the last one is when you have, uh, you know, some sort of defect that you really want to close. So you would actually create primary intention closure. And we will show you the different types of extraction defects that, that may uh, not require it, but it's highly recommended. So what are the 
key characteristic differences between cross-linked and non-cross-linked membranes. And basically cross-linking is just the manufacturer's way of organizing the collagen fibrils in the membrane and usually into a more organized way and using things like glutaraldehyde, aldehyde, ribose, or things like that to cause those collagen fibrils to be in a conformation that is stable uh, and, and, and that's what causes the biodurability. It, it makes the membrane last and protect longer but all the while still being a resorbable membrane. The non-resorbable membranes, obviously they have great protection characteristics, but they also carry risk uh, because you have risk of exposure and infection and a lot of plaque sometimes gets trapped on it. So, uh, you know, the, the nice thing about a cross-linked collagen membrane, a resorbable cross-linked membrane, is that you get both protection as well as uh, still being able to promote soft tissue growth over without the need to go in for a secondary removal uh, procedure. So the cork technique is, is probably what many of us do. Uh, for example, tooth comes out. Remember the most important part uh, and one of the things that causes early implant failure as well as graft failure uh, is the lack of debridement. And you can see on these microscope pictures that man, you, you know, sometimes you know, the extraction site may look kind of clean just on first glance, but if you really are careful and you're feeling that nice scrapey feeling when you're using your curettes, uh, it's really important to debride very well. In fact, you can take a large uh, round burr with a lot of saline and, and just run it slow, but use that to plane the inside of the socket that not only promotes bleeding, but also gets out some of the granulation tissue that you might not have noticed. Uh, as we've talked about, we place our particulate bone graft, and then the cork is just like, for example, this one is a compressed collagen plug. And because of how simple this extraction was, there was not you know, any defects that we saw on the buckle or the palatal. Uh, this makes for a very predictable and very simple uh, type procedure. You can run a couple of figure eight sutures or interrupted sutures over just to hold the membrane. But remember, these cork technique uh, membranes typically only will last for, you know, three days to three weeks, you know. So it's definitely uh, not as protective and many patients will complain about bone uh, particle migration into the mouth. Uh, so since we're, we're looking at grafting, one key question that I get is what are the appropriate graft volume sizes, right? Because, you know, if you're buying it or your staff member is buying it for you, how, what do you actually carry? And typically, uh, small incisors, you can use 0.25 cc's. Premolars can be about 0.5 cc's, and that also includes some larger incisors like central incisors. Uh, and the molars, usually one cc will do. So one more time, small incisors, 0.25 cc's, premolars is about 0.5 cc's, and molars is about one cc. So you see how it kind of doubles itself every time. Uh, also, how high should we condense that bone? That bone should be condensed to the bone level because what you're doing is bone grafting. You're not trying to do soft tissue grafting. And really, remember what the blood clot is looking at. It is looking at the environment. So for us to bone graft past the soft tissue really won't give the blood clot a good chance in that very coronal increment to become bone simply because there's soft tissue surrounding it as well. Uh, so really, it's kind of a moot point to go past the bony uh, envelope that is already there, unless you're doing ridge augmentation, which is a little bit different, and we'll talk about a little bit about that as well, okay? Uh, mask technique, like I said, is the one that we use the most, um, and uh, it's it's you can use PTFE, which is basically Teflon, and this is a non-resorbable way of doing it. It's a really fast way to do ridge preservation because, uh, you know, the the membrane is nice and rigid, allows you to tuck very well. And uh, it is only really for conscientious patients because actually this upper part, you can see in the middle picture, it does trap some plaque and patients a lot of times will complain about a bad smell, okay? Uh, so that was with a uh, non-resorbable membrane. Now, most of the time we do it with resorbable membranes. And so for example, in this situation, uh, you can see uh, number 31 is compromised. Uh, and what we did was we go ahead and sectioned number 31 and we remove the roots individually. And if you're not comfortable sectioning, I really recommend that you do more of it because that's probably the best way for you to be as minimally traumatic as possible because most teeth can be fulcrumed from within, which is really nice. And this, for example, this is an alloplast material. 
And the point of me showing you all these different types of materials is that actually my bone graft choice is probably the, the least important part. The debridement was probably the most important part. Uh, and also using the membrane is the most important part. Because at the end of the day, vital bone, the patient's own native vital bone is what we want long term. We don't want the implant to be inside cow bone or human or dead human bone or uh, synthetic bone. That's not the point. What we want is a scaffold that provides structure uh, but allows the blood clot to actually resorb it and to turn over into vital bone. So hopefully what's coming across is that really the bone particle selection is less important. And if you're going to choose bovine, for example, all you do differently is you wait longer. Uh, if you choose alloplast and FDBA, you wait about four months. If you choose uh, DFDBA, which is the demineralized allograft, then you wait less time, right? Uh, but really, the, the, the choice of the bone graft is how long of a scaffold you need, right, for that bone to create structure. And if you have a really nice clean extraction, you could probably just get away with the DFDBA. If you are like me and I kind of sit, try to sit kind of middle of the road for all patients so I don't have to have all the different types of bone grafts, uh, I usually use FDBA or alloplast and wait about four months time. So again, con condense, 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 and always work from a smaller condenser to a larger condenser to make sure that you get a nice uh, packing into the root spaces because the blood clot wants to be surrounded uh, by uh, bone influencing products, right? And here you can see a resorbable, a cross-linked resorbable membrane uh, was tucked into the buckle and into the palatal. And at the last point, you can use a continuous uh, interlocking suture or just a continuous suture uh, uh, to go ahead and secure it. And, and notice how primary closure was not actually achieved in this situation uh, because this is not a very large defect per se. Uh, and this is how I do 90% of the ridge preservations, but I always try to lay a flap uh, and try to use a membrane because if you don't use a membrane, you may get lucky 80% of the time, but you just don't have two out of 10 people coming into your office and you don't have that time to, to, to redo this re-entry procedure, right? So uh, it's really important that, you know, a patient has already waited months for their implant to be placed. So if they're gonna wait four months, you really hope that the, the time that you go in is the time you place the implant, otherwise the patients are not happy. And we found that as a private practice model, this method works really well uh, because our re-entry is typically our only re-entry for implant placement. The, the last methodology for, for uh, doing the bone grafting is the SEAL method, the primary closure method. Uh, and we'll talk about when we actually do that. Uh, but what's important is that, you know, once the tooth is removed and the ridge preservation is actually being done, the bone grafts being packed in, a periosteal release, which is the middle bottom picture, is really, really important because uh, that's really what causes you to have flap uh, release and, and tensionless flaps. And, and this is not something that we're teaching right now, uh, but the, the idea is this, and I think this is sometimes kind of uh, overly mystified. There's two types of tissue, generally speaking. You have the keratinized attached tissue, and then you have the mucosal non-attached tissue, both are which are bound by periosteum. So the difference between mucosal stretchy tissue and keratinized attached non-stretchy tissue uh, is just that there's elastic fiber, elastin fibers in the mucosal tissue. So anywhere that you want to be to close, to pull, to stretch, you want to be in the mucosal portion. So the, the reason not all mucosal tissue will stretch immediately is because even though it by itself is a stretchy tissue, it is lined by periosteum. So the idea of periosteal release is using a, a blade or a scissor to cut kind of the carpet on the under that stretchy tissue, make an incision through it so that we can take advantage of those elastic fibers and pull uh, the tissue over. This is an example of a uh, extract and graft that was not done well. And, and my suspicion was uh, that not enough degranulation or debridement was done. And you can see that after uh, four months, this patient uh, was referred to me because on a CT scan from the previous provider, uh, it just looked dark. 
and you can see soft tissue infiltrate. And four months later, what we had to do is we just had to cure it all back out. And you can see that the defect pretty much remains. So remember, it's almost not even important exactly what bone graft that was put in. The problem was that the environment trumps that choice of bone graft. The environment caused this bone graft to fail. So whether a xenograft, allograft, or alloplast was placed in really didn't matter because granulation tissue was still in there. And like I said, granulation tissue is very reactive and it'll infiltrate uh, the site very quickly. So all we did was use bone graft material. And in this case, we used DFDBA because the patient was in a hurry and the bone uh, defect wasn't very large. Uh, placed a cross-linked collagen resorbable membrane did primary closure, you know? And so every time I want a lower risk, I do primary closure. And you'll see that as, as we go through things. Now, healing patient perceptions are kind of interesting. When you do only the cork method, a lot of patients will have bony migration. Doesn't mean that the actual bone graft is failing, but because the non cross link collagen membranes aren't that sturdy. A lot of times the bone particles will come out. So if you're using a lot of colla tape, colla plug, those types of things, uh, you will actually find a lot of patients complain about little sandy particles that make it out. Um, and a lot of times when you do your reentry, once you open up the flap, it's going to feel a little bit fuzzy. Okay. Uh, one step above that, which I think is the better way to do it, is to do the mask method. But if you do the mask method, in, like the picture in the middle, uh, with a non-resorbable membrane, a lot of times they will complain about a bad taste and a bad smell. Still works, uh, but I've actually pretty much gone away with the non-resorbable membranes and just use cross-linked resorbable membranes. And typically those will last about four to six weeks and enough time for the soft tissue to have granulated over. Uh, and then the last is uh, primary closure using the seal technique. Uh, when you have large defects and you try to close, if the closure isn't really well done, uh, mattress sutures weren't used well, a lot of times you'll have patients say that, oh, I feel a cleft in there. A uh, bone graft will probably do just fine, especially when a resorbable membrane was placed because that soft tissue underneath is already granulated over and the cleft will eventually uh, smooth itself out. So, uh, you know, there are five Ds in predicting ridge preservation success, and one is defect. We need to look at the defect and say, how bad is this extraction defect? And then say, what disease is present? How can I debride out that disease, both chemically and mechanically, then place a dense bony increment and then cause the environment to have durability, whether that means placing a membrane or doing your suturing in a very intentional way. And uh, a, a kind of a paper out of uh, my alma mater, Loma Linda, uh, basically took a look at different extraction sites, especially in the anterior area where it's very uh, tricky to, to fix certain defects. Uh, and they se separated different defects into EDS 1, 2, 3, and 4. And without getting too far into the weeds, uh, basically look at the first box on the left, right? Uh, the general assessment of this extraction defect, pristine right? Hard tissue loss, which is the middle box, zero millimeters. Will we get good soft tissue uh, predictability? The answer is yes. And so a lot of times we'll say, okay, then let's immediately place the implant because everybody's kind of going towards this immediacy thing, right? Uh, now, just going one step down from pristine, so pristine to slight damage, uh, and if you have two millimeters of soft, hard tissue loss, all of a sudden, you know, soft tissue, ideal soft tissue contours are achievable, but not predictable. So that goes to show that even though immediacy and you see a lot of marketing, a lot of education on just immediate implant placement, immediate implant placement, immediate implant placement, I will say from a private practice standpoint, the best way to do it is still to go through ridge preservation, especially when there are defects present. Now in the anterior area, the reason immediate implants are so popular is because having an immediate provisional or an immediate custom healing abutment does give you better soft tissue results. But you will see through a couple of cases here, when the defects are large, even in the anterior area, it is better to ridge preserve first. So uh, these are very simple type extraction cases. Uh, and these are the EDS ones, right? When you look at this, you know there's not much soft tissue loss. You know that there's no hard tissue loss. This is a pristine site. And for cases like this, we know what to do. We extract the tooth. Uh, we go ahead and place the implant immediately. We go ahead and, uh, you know, make sure that we do a, you know, if you want to do a connective tissue graft, uh, we tunnel it in there. We know how to do this, right? Because EDS-1s are easy to manage uh, because you don't have a large defect present that you need to fix, right? 
And so with the EDS-1, we usually do our immediate implant placement, possible CT graft, and we provisionalize for the sake of preserving the soft tissue. But what about this, right? So you'll see EDS-1s are easy to diagnose. And then you have the ugly ones like this. This is a number nine site. I mean, this is not what you want to do on a Monday morning, right? A really large defect, nine millimeters plus of a facial U-shaped defect. Uh, and so what I've learned from my mentor is Dr. Kans always told me, hey, don't pray for too many miracles at once. So now we're going to talk about with these really large defects, how I manage them, uh, because uh, closure becomes a, a actual factor, right? Remember, when you have nice bony walls, the environment is already good. So you don't have to create that environment. When the environment is not good in these EDS-4 type cases, you have to create that environment. So uh, take this, for example, uh, poor, poor lady, 40 years uh, old, came in uh, with a lot, ton of pain, a fistula, and when we laid the flap, uh, we could see that number eight was kind of uh, already, you know, very compromised. There was a fistula in between the actual uh, two teeth, and when we laid the flap, there was an abscess that was right in between those two teeth. So uh, we had to do prophylactic endo on number seven. But look at this defect, because this is a, we're, we're trying to diagnose defects, which is the first parameter uh, of successful ridge preservation. Uh, and look at how many walls are present, right? If the blood clot was going to sit there, it looks to the facial nothing. It looks to uh, you know the distal; it sees a tooth. On the mesial, it sees a little bit of bone. And, and surprisingly, and this doesn't happen very often, but large infections can a lot of times tunnel through uh, to the palatal area. And you can see that there's a palatal fenestration. So remember that influence model that we were talking about. That blood clot literally is sitting there looking around and it's confused, right? So this environment is not good. So how can we, after an extraction, and after we see what a crazy type defect this is, how can we actually cause this area to become an environment that is conducive for osseous construction? And so uh, what I do typically, you know, when I need flat mobility is I love doing vertical incisions. I've never seen a patient, I've never heard a patient complain about quote unquote scars, and you'll hear this occasionally about scarless dentistry. I mean, for me, I've never had a patient com com complain about some gingival scar, and if it's done well, you don't really see it. But for me, the reason I'm doing it is because I need mobility of the flap. And periosteal releasing incisions, like we showed you, does some, but it doesn't do enough. And so after the flap is opened up, what we did was we did a lot of debridement. Uh, and then what I did was I go ahead and I, I tunneled a, a resorbable collagen membrane in there, but that it was cross-linked just to block out. Remember with the influence model, right? We want to influence it. So I blocked it out uh, with a membrane so that it doesn't see soft tissue. Okay, and you can see that it's a few full mucoperiosteal tunnel. Uh, and once I block that palatal fenestration out, I did my bone grafting. Then what we want is the bone is the bone graft uh, to mature in a way that the blood clot is not confused, right? And so right now the blood clot would theoretically be sitting within this FDBA particulate mass, but if it looks on the facial, it's still going to see soft tissue, right? So how do we prevent that? Well, uh, what we're going to do is obviously we're going to do a nice bony. Uh, uh, kind of mound, and then I'm going to cut a collagen membrane to uh, the correct conformation. I typically do this captain underpants type conformation, and then we go ahead and we tuck that little, uh, the sharper area towards the palatal side, and then I drape it towards the facial. So what am I doing here? Uh, what I'm doing is I'm making sure that the blood clot has no question uh, about whether to become bone or soft tissue, okay, uh, because I'm blocking out the soft tissue, and that is why membranes are important. Uh, and like I said, you can get bone growth without membranes, but man, for predictable results, especially in these large defects, uh, once you diagnose a defect like this, know that a membrane is going to be needed, okay? Uh, and we go ahead, and I personally like to uh, go ahead and secure the membrane using periosteal uh, engaging sutures and internal mattress sutures, and we go ahead and do our periosteal release. And and one thing that is really important that we talked about is durability. That, that's also one of the uh, key components of successful ridge grafting. Uh, and typically, I do a lot of mattress sutures because mattress sutures are good at holding tension and holding the flap coronally. So first, I just do an external mattress suture. Then I do two little vertical sutures towards the papilla area to kind of pinch that tissue up. Uh, and then you can see through this diagram 
where those sutures are doing. So the first one is the horizontal suture, then the two vertical sutures. That should be sufficient just to hold the flap down uh, and then a whole bunch of interrupted sutures, obviously just to clean everything up. So at two weeks, we get a, a reasonably nicely healed uh, soft tissue. And remember, it's a resorbable collagen membrane, so it's very tissue friendly. So soft tissue, even if you don't get perfect, perfect closure, and you have a little bit of exposure somewhere, just know that typically it will still granulate uh, well. And so this is at five months, and we go ahead and we take a look. So the soft tissue still looks deficient, but the question is, did we regenerate enough bone from the crazy defect that originally was there to place the implant? And for the soft tissue defect here, we can always throw in a connective tissue graft, et cetera. So this is where we started. And this is a usual extraction defect that most people do not want to see. Uh, but is it possible, given the, uh, I, you know, you see how there's so many uh, bony islands, you see that there are areas that bone is literally missing. Uh, is this able to be ridge preserved? Can you do some sort of bone grafting to actually replace the missing bone, right? And so these arrows show you uh, where the missing bone is. The membrane is tucked in the palatal. Uh, we were able to also drape the facial. So look at the difference between the original picture and what this environment is actually creating now. Uh, and you should start to see that, oh my gosh, ridge grafting is actually not that complicated. Even a scary case like this, it still follows normal surgical principles and bone, uh, sorry, blood clot influencing principles, which is don't let your blood clot see anything you don't want it to become, okay? And so you can see the CT scan, we have plenty of bone for implant placement, uh, about five to six millimeters, and we will do a soft tissue graft just to plump up that facial later on, okay? So uh, the key question um, is, what is the difference between ridge preservation and ridge augmentation? And the truth is that the last case that you saw, some people would consider that a ridge augmentation. And the, and, and the general difference is that if you're grafting within the original, what you thought the alveolar housing would be, that's ridge preservation. If you're grafting outside of that, it's ridge augmentation. But you can see that really the lines are kind of uh, blurry, you know, like this theoretically was an extract and graft, but yet really it was an extract and ridge augmentation. And you will find that as these EDS4s are being diagnosed in your clinic, you're going to start doing these pseudo ridge preservations that are really leaking to ridge augmentation. So make sure that you code and, and charge accordingly because the work needed to do it is very different. However, the principles are still the same, right? You still use the same principles of, uh, of in establishing your defect, figuring out how to get a dense bone graft in, creating a durable environment for this bone graft uh, so that you can actually get a good result. So uh, the larger the defect, the larger the graft, the more important the closure was. So you see, when I have risky situations, I do primary closure. How about this situation? I had a, a patient come in with an eight millimeter bone sounding, which means that I know that there's some sort of facial defect. And when we uh, lift it up, we actually said, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, we could see where the white area where it kind of juts in there, that's where the defect was. Uh, is it a terrible defect? The answer is no. Is it possible to place an implant at the same time? It's possible, but our soft tissue uh, results achievable? Yes, but are they predictable? The answer is no. And so, you know, you could always make that judgment, uh, but I've become more and more risk averse in private practice. And so for me, site preservation is always a, a poss if it's a possibility and I know how to do it well, uh, it's never a bad way to go. And so uh, here we've done our particulate bone graft, nice dense increment, placed our collagen membranes to prevent the soft, uh, the soft tissue from influencing our blood clot. Then, like I said, I love doing these papilla sparing vertical incisions that helps me get closure. And some people would say, oh my gosh, you're decreasing the soft tissue. Actually, you're not, you're just repositioning the soft tissue. And once it's nicely healed, uh, what, what we did was we placed our implant. Uh, would immediate implant placement have preserved certain structures better? Uh, yes or no? And this is a really interesting question specific to this case. Well, uh, let's go through the procedure first and we'll talk about the difference of what would have happened if we did do immediate placement versus not. So we did this one as a delayed placement. So we grafted the bone, bone was there, uh, and then we went ahead and provisionalized. And provisionalization is just required to pinch the tissue back to a conformation that looks like papillae, right? And so did we actually lose papilla? And the answer is yes, very slightly, but yes. 
but is this a clinically acceptable situation and was it a predictable way of doing surgery? And I think that's more important than gaining one or two millimeters more of papilla, right? So if you look, you do we did miss a little bit of papilla and papillae typically uh, are maintained through structure. It's not a surgical uh, event. Papillae are a restorative event. Now, obviously, if you don't have enough thickness of tissue, there's not amount, any amount of shaping you can possibly do. So those patients need connective tissue grafts. So if I placed immediate implant in this situation, I could have theoretically made an immediate provisional. That provisional would have held the papillae in place so that they wouldn't blunt out. But you can see that with proper ridge grafting, you're still able to get a nice semblance of papillae back as long as you still do the provisionalization after your delayed implant placement and pinch the tissue back to where it needs to be. So even though this is an anterior case and many people would not fathom doing delayed placement in a number eight site, you can see that this is still a very possible event and in fact, a very clinically acceptable event as well. So remember the most important question was when is graft success determined? Well, uh, it was debridement and disease control. And here you can see uh, that there was active disease in this situation uh, in this number uh, nine site. And a lot of people would ask, well, can I place an implant or do bone grafting immediately after, uh, you know, you have a separative, you know, either a fistula or an abscess? And the answer is, well, if you can do the, the justified disease and debridement control, absolutely you can. So here you can see that, you know, we've cleaned everything up. We see where the tooth is. We see where the, uh, the residual granulation tissue was. And so we need to do both mechanical and chemical debridement. And so obviously the mechanical part, we all know. I took the tooth out. Uh, you can go ahead and debride it uh, with a curette or a rotary instrument. Uh, and then what I love to do is just take an antibiotic like amoxicillin. I pour it out, mix it with some saline and drench it in gauze and do some uh, chemical debridement. And there's not much literature or research to say that this really makes a big difference, but it definitely makes me sleep a little bit better at night uh, knowing that I've created an environment that is as clean as is possible before the bone graft goes in. And what I do is I just agitate this amoxicillin or clindamycin laced gauze and uh, I agitate it in there and leave it for about 20, 30 seconds uh, just to, uh, to have a little bit of protection there. In this situation, because the defect, and remember defect is an important part, but because the defect was so apical, I actually placed the implant. The defects that are bad that require ridge preservation first are the, the buccal defects that are very coronal, that connect with the coronal area. Because as long as it can block this area out with some sort of membrane and I keep the bone graft nice and dense and tidy in there, I know that the blood clot won't be confused as to what to become. So I placed the implant in this situation. I used a probe to make sure all the nooks and crannies of the bone graft um, I get into the implant and it's able to actually create a really nice dense area. Then just like what we've already learned, we block out that area that is confusing for the blood clot with some sort of collagen membrane to cause durability to prevent any salivary enzymes, epithelium, connective tissue, periosteum, and even bacterial insult into our area. And then the last part is just doing a durable suture. I love non-resorbable sutures. I love polyethylene sutures. Uh, because I always see my patients over post-op anyway, so a little bit of suture removal doesn't hurt me, uh, and uh, just to get a nice result so that we can actually grow bone back in a predictable way. So uh, should I place my implant immediately uh, or delayed, right? We get that question all the time. So the question really is, should I bone graft with an implant in there or not? The answer is the bone graft doesn't really know that there's a piece of titanium in between it, right? Uh, but when you have large defects, remember, don't ask for too many miracles. And many times it might be safer to do your implant placement uh, in a delayed way. In this situation, this is the same case that you saw in the video, right? How was I able to decide to place an Im implant immediately or not? This defect, though large, is very apical. And I was very, very, very confident that I can block out that area. I was very confident that I would still have soft tissue, nice soft tissue contours, simply because there is no bony defect on the coronal area. So treat these defects differently than your large 
coronal defects on the buckle because these defects are actually really easy to fix. It's like apical ectomies, right? They heal generally very well because everything is easily blocked out and everything is usually very apical. So in her situation, I placed that implant. You already saw the video. Uh, I go ahead and I provisionalized, uh, we sutured. And what you can see is that, uh, you know, Collagen membranes are beautiful because eventually soft tissue will grow over it, right? If this was a non-resorbable membrane, one of the stressful things about non-resorbable membranes is a exposure like this would be very stressful in the anterior area. Uh, and you can see that usually in a couple of weeks, eight weeks, soft tissue maturation happens and you will see uh, that we basically uh, can get nice soft tissue contour. So I prep the adjacent tooth, we're ready for the impression. Uh, and I wish they let me do seven, you know, six, seven, 10, 11, but that was not in the cards for the patient. Uh, and you can get a really nice result. But the important thing is look at that soft tissue area where the exposure was. The beauty of a cross-linked resorbable collagen membrane is that soft tissue will grow over over time, right? And so that's really important because in private practice, risk averse, right? We're all risk averse. And so uh, in this situation, even though this patient, you know, could be considered, you know, EDS2 because of that defect, uh, and obviously the defects in the EDS classification really are only talking about coronal ones, that was actually EDS1, so that's why I placed quotation marks on it. Don't look at a big defect by itself and say, oh, we need to only ridge preserve. If the defect is large and uh, coronal, you want to do bridge preservation first. If it's very apical, almost like an apical kind of hole and an apical abscess, and you can clean that area up with good debridement and cover that area with good durability, you can still place your implants immediately. So now, you know, immediate implant placement with quote unquote immediate bone grafting and ridge preservation, those are all kind of the same thing uh, because the bone graft doesn't care that there's titanium in between it. All it thinks is that, oh, there's a large tenting screw in here. What really is important isn't when you place the implant per se, it's how you do your bone grafting. And once you take these skills with you, you're gonna be much more confident not only in your ridge preservation procedures, but also uh, in your immediate implant placement procedures because you know how bone reacts to confusion and you do not wanna confuse bone. So anytime you feel like the blood clot will be confused, do ridge preservation with the principles in mind, okay? Uh, are chronic endodontic lesions a contraindication to implant placement, and like we said, it is not, because as long as you understand what the defect is, and just to review, large defects, EDS force, yes, you want to preserve first or do ridge preservation slash augmentation in those situations first. However, if you have a large defect that is very apical, you can actually get away with placing the implant at the same time because you already now understand how to create that good environment for the bone to grow. And you can almost forget that the implant's in there. As long as you get that bone growth really nice, you know, the bone, the blood clot doesn't care whether it's an implant or just bone graft material in there, okay? Um, disease control, right? Notice, is it an acute infection? Is it a chronic infection? And if you know what that is, do you need to do curatage only? Do you need to do both curatage and a chemical debridement? And those are decisions that you, you need to make. And, and like I said, most people do two less of that right? The debridement stage is so, so, so important for your ridge preservation success, whether you place an implant immediately or not, okay? Uh, so debride, debride, debride. Uh, then be very intentional about, about creating a dense increment for your bone graft to be packed into, uh, and then use membranes and good suturing techniques to cause durability uh, to be there so that the environment would be very conducive for bone growth, okay? Uh, key question. So again, what are the components of predictable uh, ridge preservation success and a, a good treatment modality? It's the defect, the disease, uh, the debridement, density, and durability. Okay. What is the appropriate time to place an implant after ridge preservation? Well, hopefully we've beat this horse dead. Uh, remember, it depends on your particle uh, that you use, whether you use DFDBA particles, whether whether you use alloplast, whether you use FDBA or, or um, or xenograph, right? Xenograph, typically, I personally wait six months plus. Uh, FDBA, I, which is what I use most of the time, four months. Uh, and then a, a DFDBA uh, usually wait about three months. But like I said, I try to keep my practice very simple for ordering sake and for the patient's sake so that they, you know, every patient that comes to know exactly what they're going to go through. So I usually place implants uh, at four months. 
But uh, thank you for your kind attention. I know we sped through a lot of information because we have limited time. Um, and I tried to answer as many of those CE questions as possible. I think we got through all of them so that you shouldn't have any problems answering those the CE questionnaire. Uh, but we're gonna screen any questions that were uh, listed uh, right now for the question and answer. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, we've all, we already do have some questions from the audience. Um, and I would like again to invite viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions you have. Uh, our first question that came in today was, how do you integrate PRF into your bone grafting technique? Yeah, great question. You know, PRF, uh, I, you know, I was really excited about it. I bought my own machine. I do it a lot, uh, but not for the reasons that maybe, you know, some other practitioners do. So PRF, it has a whole bunch of uh, chemo factors in there, right? You have the VEGF, you have um, all sorts of crazy things that help growth. However, all those crazy things not only help, uh, you know, soft tissue growth, they may help bone growth as well. Uh, but the question is, you know, anything that could excite an osteoblast can also excite, you know, a fibroblast, right? So what you really want to do uh, in terms of PRF, in my opinion, at least, is that use it as a soft tissue adjunct. You know, I don't use it as a, uh, you know, kind of my Hail Mary to hope that the PRF is somehow going to increase my bone formation because I don't really see that in my practice. And I've done it everywhere from chopping it up uh, in, in mixing it with my bone graft to using IPRF, which is the injectable PRF, making the steak bone or the sticky bone, uh, all the way through grafting completely uh, with PRF. Uh, what I find is that, especially in very compromised patients, you know, when we're trying to hope that the PRF is going to do some magical thing, the magical part is that it does soft tissue healing quickly because you're basically creating, remember that fibrin picture that was shown, you are creating fibrin. And fibrin is kind of like the red carpet where the epithelial celebrities will just march onto. And so the beauty of it is it does encourage closure very quickly, which like I said, is important. Uh, but if you don't actually block out the defects and do good debridement, I don't think PRF does anything because because PRF is just a blood clot, right? It is still also easily influenced by other things. So if your environment is terrible and you're hoping that just by shoving a lot of PRF in there, that that's somehow going to save the day, it probably won't. And I've been nixed quite a few times because I was really excited. I did a bunch of these cases, uh, especially in smokers. Oh, PRF does not do well in smokers. So I thought that PRF would have helped me close. Actually, the blood clot kind of just necrosed and died. So uh, I, I think PRF has a place. And I think the place is, you know, clean extractions. You can use it kind of in that mask technique to help uh, bridge, but I personally would still put a membrane under the PRF. And here's why. Have you ever done kind of like an incision and start to lay your, mu your mucal periosteal flap and you get that really grainy increment uh, of the bone graft particles kind of semi-embedded in the periosteum? Uh, that's because the soft tissue has very lightly infiltrated that surface layer. So PRF, again, it will help closure, but to get a really clean increment of bone after the, the re-entry, I would still put a collagen membrane in there. So, you know, I think PRF is a great thing. It's also great for things like, you know, nerve. Uh, I had a patient that had an abscess on number 29 referred to me after we removed the tooth. Uh, the patient was had paresthesia coming in and I didn't want to poke at the nerve. What would I do? I would do PRF, make a little plug to kind of block out that area before I did my bone grafting. So my bone graft isn't going to immediately touch the, the mental foramen area. So, you know, PRF for me is a soft tissue adjunct. It is a, uh, it's a soft tissue encourager. I don't think of it as a bone graft material, even though I know it's marketed as such many times. And I'm sure that there's some very, very talented technicians that maybe can make it work a hundred percent of the time. That has not been my experience. Okay, next question. Uh, with the cork method, do you notice a difference in the quality of bone at the crest of the ridge? Yes, I do. Um, like I was saying, if you use a, a non-cross-linked collagen membrane, uh, you will find that it's kind of fuzzy, right? You, and you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you get taking a 12 blade and it just feels bumpy, it's like going on a, like a rocky road on a Jeep, right? It doesn't feel smooth. Uh, and, and the reason is, you know, that collagen membrane is not meant to last that long. It's just meant to encourage a little bit of b blood to be soaked in there. So the fibrin layer comes in quickly, uh, but it, because it doesn't actually allow for the maturation of the bone because it doesn't last that long, uh, the, the, the homogeneity of the texture isn't there. So what I found is that if you want really nice texture, 
do the mask method and if you do primary closure that surface bone will always feel a lot more solid more like a quartz countertop rather than kind of like this fuzzy carpety mess can you place your implant even if you have that carpety mess you can but it just doesn't inspire confidence you know and and remember the crustal bone is how all implants begin to fail right it's really rare that you get an apical lesion in an implant and i think it's because you have granulation tissue in there but most implants fail from the crest so if they fail from the crest and you get crestal bone loss, you want that bony increment at the crest to be as solid and foundational as possible. So my recommendation is always to do the mask method when you can. Now you will get some patients that you know are super healthy. They've got thick biotype, uh, clean as a whistle. Can you do the cork method? Absolutely, I'm not telling you not to do it, uh, but I definitely do see that the texture, and if you're seeking texture, uh, the mask method is much superior in terms of that crustal uh, portion of bone. Uh, you, you did deal with this somewhat in your presentation, but if you have anything to add, uh, this person wants you, can you describe your suturing techniques? Yeah, you know, um, suturing is, is all kind of a science all in itself, but here, here's what the, the take home message uh, I think is, when, when you're suturing, the goal is not to pull from the edges right? The incision will create two edges. If you're trying to pull from those edges, you will almost always fail, especially when you're trying to do either primary closure or, or some big graft that you've tried to release as best you can. What you need to be very comfortable to start doing are horizontal mattresses and vertical mattresses. The horizontal mattress is probably the biggest one. So if you want to start, start doing more horizontal mattresses and do them deep. And what I mean by deep is that do them as apical as you're comfortable. Like I would sometimes do them at the mucogingival junction. And what will happen is that once you throw that horizontal mattress that's real nice and deep and you tie it, you will see that your flap starts to move closer together. So what will happen is that that will make your interrupted sutures on the top or your continuous or in interlocking, whatever you wanna do at in, in between the edges, those sutures are meant to just make the edges kiss. You don't want a lot of tension on them. And so a lot of times I see things open up because not enough mattress sutures were placed. And you can place two or three of them. It doesn't really matter. As long as you get the flap to actually approximate to itself without any edge sutures yet, that's when you know you'll be successful, okay? So if you're just trying to use interrupted sutures on the, on the crest of that, 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 those two edges, things will definitely open up. So Typically what I do for the mask procedure, because that's the majority of what I do is I lay a healthy flap. I take my circular incisions pretty much to the adjacent teeth completely, uh, lay my flap, uh, do my extraction and, and clean it out real good, do my bone graft, tuck it in real nice. And when I say tuck, tuck, don't, don't just let like two millimeters tuck. Do a strong like five, six millimeter tuck into each flap. So trim your uh, membrane accordingly. Then I throw my mattress suture first, my horizontal mattress. And that mattress suture will actually hold down that, um, that membrane already. And that makes my suturing up on the top a lot easier, especially if I'm trying to get primary closure. So the only difference between the mask and the seal is that I do periosteal releasing incisions to release the flap, to take advantage of that stretchy mucosal tissue. Uh, but my horizontal mattress suture is what really causes the closure to, closure to maintain. And it's just really the question of distributing pressure on your flap. If all your incision sutures uh, if that's the only thing holding it, there's a lot of pressure uh, that is on that area. And keratinized tissue is not very vascular, so it likes to necrose. So a lot of times you'll get suture pull, and then things start to open up a lot. So a uh, key take-home message is do more horizontal sutures. Uh, and at the corners, if you want to be a little fancier, where the papilla are, do some vertical uh, vertical mattress sutures, that will help pinch up the tissue a little bit. But I think that's getting a little into the weeds. If you are really good at mat horizontal mattress suture and really apical ones, you're gonna do just fine. Okay, next, is it necessary to hydrate the graft with sterile saline prior to placing the graft? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, I hydrate my uh, my graft only because it makes it a little bit more homogenous. Like I can I can deliver it easier without bone grafts being on the tongue and on the cheek and all that stuff. Uh, you could theoretically draw up some blood that's pulled up and kind of mix it with the blood. I've seen plenty of people do that. That's totally okay as well. Uh, but saline is uptaken by the body really quickly. So the, it's not like if you use saline, it's going to be problematic for your blood uh, uh, your your blood clot to get through it. 
But I would say that, you know, no, it is not a, a requirement. Uh, it's just more of a convenience thing for me uh, to, to do it that way. But you could absolutely mix it with, you know, even some PRF fluid, some blood, uh, and, and, and it should still give you really good results either way. Have you ever used placenta membranes? I have. Uh, Corion, Amnion, and Corion alone. Uh, they're good. Uh, they're expensive. And so I found that the, the more I do, the less uh, technologically um, picky I am. You know, I think as long as you follow principles, you're going to do well. So Amnion Corion uh, does very quickly cause soft tissue uh, to, to kind of bridge over it. So if you have a, a very nice supplier that you can get, you know, nice inexpensive membranes that have great closure capability, absolutely. I, I think they're great membranes. Uh, they don't, in my opinion, last as long as some of the cross-link collagen membranes, uh, but for many cases, that's not important. However, I do think that they cause granulation to go over pretty quickly, and that is by in itself pretty cool. Uh, for me, I like kind of these thicker collagen membranes because I also want them to turn into thicker connective tissue uh, because it's, it's kind of my, uh, my belief that that the thicker the connective tissue is, uh, the better the long-term outcome of the implant. But you know, some people debate that as well. But definitely, they work. So um, you can try it out. If it works great for you and it's a financially sound thing for your office, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Because remember, a collagen membrane is just a—it's uh, a resorbable membrane, right? And so uh, if that amnion chorion is going to resorb as well, then it should theoretically work just as well, as long as you kind of know how many weeks it'll stay. And my general target is about six to eight weeks for the membrane to be intact. Okay, next question. Do you use BMP mixed with any type of bone graft? If yes, how frequently do you feel the difference in the quality of bone? Uh, quality, I feel like there's zero improvement, zero. And I, I did a couple BMP cases while I was in residency. Uh, they, they're crazy expensive. They get shipped it's got to get shipped cold um, and it's it's so much logistical work and I think that anytime you know we believe that there's just some magic bullet that's going to increase uh, that can increase bone formation I don't quite believe that believe it and even if it did do that it's probably a, a temporary situation because remodeling happens all the time if someone were to try to convince me that somehow BMP is going to create more dense bone or, or denser trabecular bone or more vascular bone I just don't believe it because at the end of the day, is it not your blood clot that becomes the bone, right? So the scaffold, in my opinion, is more important. Now, BMP may speed up bone formation, uh, but you know, how often do I really need the patient to come in maybe, what, two, three months earlier? Who knows, right? It's all kind of patient-based. I've just found that tried and true principles and don't kind of get into the weeds of you know, spending on things that are, in my opinion, a little bit gimmicky uh, is probably safer. Uh, but if you want to try it and finances are not an issue, do I think BMP will make the patient have an adverse outcome? Uh, no, uh, but just be ready. If you do a large ridge augmentation with BMP, the patient will swell like you've never seen before. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, it's not a harmful swelling, but their face will swell up. And, and it's pretty dramatic, and you just prepare the patient for it, say, hey, you're going to swell and bruise like crazy. Uh, BMP just does that. So uh, I would generally not need it for ridge preservation procedures. Uh, I can think of just a very small handful where I really think I'll even need it for ridge augmentation procedures. Uh, so, you know, like I said, you know, the environment is more important than the product, right? You could choose your bone graft, you could choose your membranes, but at the end of the day, if the environment wasn't properly organized, it doesn't matter. You could throw as much BMP as you want, and I can guarantee if you left a ton of granulation tissue, uh, it wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. Yeah. Okay, our last question. Regarding suturing, I tend to hook up the membrane by the needle. How do you avoid that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, first thing is lay a bigger flap because if you're hooking up the, the 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 membrane, it's typically because your membrane is too close to the flap already. So what you can do is once you lay a bigger flap, you can kind of peel the membrane, uh, not the membrane, sorry, peel the flap away from the membrane. You could literally see where you're poking through, right? Now I can say that, yeah, sometimes I get a little lazy uh, and I don't do a big enough flap and I'm, I've tucked my membrane in, uh, but I, I'm hooking my, uh, my suture on that membrane. What you can do is uh, I like using a Lucas curette and basically 
holding the membrane down on one side and trying to aim for my Lucas curate with my needle tip and it'll kind of just ricochet off of it. And you can use, I mean, anything that you have. I mean, you could use a, a, a Buser periosteal elevator. You can use a whatever metal instrument that, that has a little bit of separation and just aim for that instrument and let your needle tip ricochet off of that. That will generally help you. Um, but you know, you, you'll, you'll get much better at at this and at one point you're going to go ahead and and not even need any of that and be able to pass your suture through without nicking your membrane so uh you know you're going to get there uh, but in the meantime train with the lucas curette i think that's probably the easiest one to use uh, and then there are a couple you know specialized instruments that are like uh, tissue forceps that have uh, actually kind of like a sleuth way for the needle to come out uh, but they're like 200 bucks and I don't really think they're worth it. So start with the Lucas Curette uh, and lay a bigger flap. That'll get you, I would say 99% of the way there. Okay, well, thank you everybody for all those, those great questions, but we've run out of time today. So if you have a question, we can answer it after the webinar via email. Please be sure to take the free CE quiz associated with this webinar. Shortly, we will send you a recording of the presentation and instructions on how to access the CE quiz. Thank you all for attending, and a special thank you to Dr. Chen for an amazing uh, presentation. It was very, very informative and interesting. And to our sponsor for this webinar, Implant Direct. Thank you, have a good day, and stay safe out there. Thank you.